Well, I would like to thank uh, Penelope and Florence for letting me here. And also, I would like to apologize for my English because I'm freezing, it's not my first language, and I would probably black out at some point thinking about a concept or something. <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, the title, I usually like to make these kinds of titles because they look great. Uh, I was uh, copy editing an article by David Kobialka a couple of years ago, and I thought, wow, that could be great for a book. And I told him, because I didn't want to do it, uh, he didn't want it either, so I just told you that if anyone wants to do something with what I'm saying today, tell me. Uh, I, will, I will publish it. <laughs> 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 anyway, <laughs> so basically I will start uh, with a bit of archaeology and public archaeology, because I call myself a public archaeologist, because I don't do archaeology as such anymore. So, in terms of time, archaeology you now is about the past, public archaeology is about the present, or better, how the past affects the present, but the question is, is it about the future, no? and we have all these cliches, like uh, this one, we study the past to understand the present, we understand the present to guide the future, no? which is like friendly, like nice, oh yeah, past is cool. Or, I think you used it before, no? <laughs> the other darker one, no? like who controls the past, controls the future, who controls the present, controls the past. At the end, we're kind of always playing now with this kind of uh, appeal for time in some way, no? by which uh, as a archaeologist, uh, we were talking before about the voyeurism and all that, no, we love the past, but we love the past for a reason. And in some way, this reason, as I said before, is kind of the future, but how or really why do we do it? No? And um, for example, I wanted to use this example that uh, I, I brought here actually in 2013, not here in Liverpool in 2013, that this uh, from real like public archaeology work in, in Ethiopia. No, like uh, these guys uh, were living in a place in Ethiopia called Melka Kunture, that is a small village uh, one hour south of Addis, and has a great Paleolithic archaeological site, uh, which is probably going to be nominated for World Heritage soon. So they contacted me as a consultant to solve a pollution problem for the archaeological site. But we realized when we were starting to work there that it was actually a pollution problem for the community around. So we were actually using heritage to change you know, things in like the future of real communities who were actually affected by something that was not such a big problem for the archaeological site. That these people didn't even care about the Paleolithic. You no, know? it was something that supposedly was great for everybody in the country because it was going to bring millions or whatever, as we always tell them. No, but they really didn't care about it because they didn't have any direct link with it. For them, this past was not even happening no, in, in their lives, even if it was like 200 meters from their houses. But uh, for example, through these projects, we were trying to bring them to this past you know, and also to bring them you know, to a different future. But anyway, <laughs> this was just uh, because I like to talk about this one. And uh, <laughs> I have uh, another issue to talk about, that is how, ima how we imagine the future. Because, well, future is coming all the time, and we are always in the future. We have two main ways, that is utopia. Sorry, I'm a bit chaotic sometimes. You can stop me or whatever. We have a uh, utopia, no? which is like the friendly way of imagining the future, which is like the good place. No? We have always this kind of amazing uh, architecture, which is, wow, this is cool. I would love to live here. People is having each other. I'm very happy you know, because everybody is like in the perfect place. And then we have you know, all these dystopias, you know, which are supposed to be the bad places, where the world basically went to hell just Turn out kind of wrong. No, I use this image of uh, this uh, novel, well, the adaptation, you know, flip of uh, the Handmaid's Tale. No, because what I wanted to say is that yeah, we have uh, utopias, dystopias, but at the end, they are not that clear. No, and what for many people are utopias for some others, like can be for example, Brave New World, are really a dystopia or. What for many people are really bad dystopias, like could be one 1984. Ah, sorry, this was 1984, but it's not anywhere, so I think it was there. Uh, for many people within the story, was actually a, a utopia because they were actually living in the place they really wanted to live. You know, like uh, the ones controlling the others were actually happy and they were doing what they wanted, while 
everyone else was not really happy. And we can actually see that on Black Mirror that also came out uh, before. Uh, by the way, uh, fourth season is coming out, the 29th. So watch it. Netflix pays me for this. Uh, and they, they actually show that. No? Like, uh, they are imagining these uh, futures in which technology is bringing us like happiness, brand new things which are amazing. No? Like, imagine that you can actually communicate just doing this, or uh, social media will let you do that, and everything will be connected, and we all will be happy. No, but always, at the end, besides a couple of chapters, there is a really bad ending, because at the end, all these utopias are not that good. <laughs> anyway, uh, where does this take sense? No? Like, would it be possible, and um, that's where like the idea of the title came, to excavate uh, those futures that happened in the past, or all this science fiction that was imagining a near future that has already happened? No, because most of these novels, uh, video games, movies, etc., were written, filmed in the early, well, even in the 17th or 16th centuries, but in the early 20th century, mid 20th century, late 20th century, and they were portraying a future that is actually happening today, and it's happening in a very different way. Uh, so, well, I just put this there, so you can read it, but I, I would like to bring a couple of Spanish examples, okay? Uh, this is Daniel García Raso, that is a kind of a good friend of mine, who actually published two great, well, three great books, two of them are these ones. We are working on the English edition of this one, which is about video games and archaeology. And uh, in this one, he actually applies all these material culture studies, uh, ideas, no, to actually analyze the video game as an archaeological artifact in some way, not only in its material uh, presence, no, like uh, archaeo gaming, for example, with the Atari excavation and all that, but also in the digital one and everything that is around no, the, the video game production, etc. No, so I'm looking at the video one as an archaeologist. And he's actually telling there how we can actually look at the material culture going on within the, the games, no, and actually learn things about the societies that are portrayed within these video games and that actually in some way are a reflex of ourselves in a different world, no, that is at the end uh, what, what we are doing all the time. Uh, and actually within Arco Gaming you have uh, good examples of that, like Andrew Reinhardt with all these numismatic works, no, on World of Warcraft and other video games, or even with No Man's Sky, that he's probably the only one playing right now. Anyway, and then the other one is a novel, and it's a Ucronia, which basically uh, is like the one who were seeing, uh, Troy, what, what was your name? Troy War? No. Uh, your name, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> like the ones you were talking about, the Second World War, but it's happening after the uh, dictatorship in Spain. <coughs> so basically, uh, basically, what he says is, uh, what would happen if Franco, that was the dictator, would have a male son, no, like yeah, son, uh, and when he died, the dictatorship have continued you now instead of uh, coming back to democracy, blah, blah, blah. No? So the funny thing of the story is the, the, the plot, because it's a detective story, detective novel, you know, starts with a robbery in the Spanish National Museum in one of the rooms that was devoted to the figure of Franco you know, and his heritage. And within this heritage, uh, this is, because it's a bit ironic, you know, uh, what they are actually stealing <laughs> is a can of foie gras because it was his favorite uh, meal, and he was actually eating it when he died. So it was like the main you know, artifact in the museum. You know? Like, who would put a, a can of foie gras in a museum? I don't know, well, maybe in the museum of foie gras, especially open. No? But the thing is that, well, the plot is funny because uh, they are trying to revive Franco because his song was making actually like a shift to democracy, so uh, everybody was wondering why are not still the dictatorship. Because for many people, the, the dictatorship was and still is actually in real Spain very good. Uh, but well, just wanted to, to bring it here because it's an example from like outside the Anglo Saxon world and actually has archaeology as one of the main uh, parts of the plot. Uh, maybe it's in English at some point and you can read it. So uh, let's bring more examples. Now we have Metropolis. 
Uh, let me start with Simon. 1927, supposed to happen in 2026. No? So at the end, which were the problems that they were bringing no, uh, within the, the movie? At the end, it's a matter of class. It's a matter of uh, love after the great war. No? Like uh, maybe we can solve problems with love and not fighting. Or why the war is so unfair with all this industrial revolution that we had and is bringing everything like uh, to chaos and uh, and. It, uh, no, it's called, uh, yeah, first blackout, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and like uh, an equality, you know, and all those problems that we have. You know? So we're kind of projecting our fears into the science fiction. It's very clear, for example, with these two movies, you know, like Mad Max, uh, 79, supposedly happening around the early 21st century, or Escape from New York, from 81, and happening in 1997. So uh, this moment is like a still like the remains of all the petroleum crisis and actually you know it's not only the main plot in mad max but it also appears you know like secondary position the other movie because uh, what they are saying is like okay the world is going to hell because we are running out of oil and this will basically end with everything uh, that we know, know about uh, how to do things or how to live you know? so they are bringing back like a, an apocalyptic future based on the fears that they had in that moment, no, when they were writing the movies. Uh, well, Blade Runner, I will pass by far, because we had something exclusive, but uh, it's also supposed uh, to happen at some point, no, in the late 90s, early 21st century, but at the end you see how the different worlds also show what we are actually conceptualizing as a future heritage, no? Like uh, with all the architecture, the things that we have, how they remind us of uh, different pasts, no? uh, depending on what they are representing. So here is a little bit more uh, aesthetic and uh, peaceful and classical. No? Well, here is a little bit more baroque because it's a bit more chaotic and it's like the dark side of it. No? So how all these images are kind of uh, building an idea of uh, what is nice, what is not nice, and how these images are actually based on our past, portrayed into the future, and representing our present. No, like, uh, again, back to the future, and this is something I usually like, no? I will say that at the end of the world, but uh, you usually dress people like punks when they are bad people. Now, why punks are bad? They are not bad. I, I was, when I was young, anyway. And uh, <laughs> for example, also in the Terminator, no, which uh, supposed to happen in 1997, when Skynet awake and all that. Um, you know, uh, did you know Flight of the Concords? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, you know, just found it very funny because it's a, a very good way of actually understanding how these futures, no, are, are even happening. Because I think the song is from 2004 or something like that. No, but are still like in the collective imaginary, no, uh, and. Even like realizing that we are actually thinking about a future that is going to happen sometimes in like 15, 20, 25 years. Uh, are we really expecting something like this happening in 15 years? No, like, uh, what? Sorry, this one. Well, I use the old one because it fit better the the screen. No, but for example, in in the Alien Saga, Wayland Corporation, the only Wayland was actually starting like all the empire in 2012. Maybe Google or Apple or something like that are behind all this now. But at the end, <laughs> you know, NASA is expecting to go to Mars in 2050, maybe. <laughs> maybe it doesn't work, you know? <laughs> like, no, but we are still like trying to, to think uh, about uh, very close futures that are quite different from reality, maybe because this uh, closeness makes a more direct connection you know, with our like uh, our contemporary like present existence. So anyway, well, a small critique on this. Uh, our conception of time is linear. So we think about a past, we think about a present, we are living now, we think about a future 
where we live in the future. No? But uh, there is a slight problem with this, that this is a kind of occidental, Judeo-Christian, and associates uh, way of understanding the world. And there is many people, young citizens, all around the world who does not think about time in this way. So how would be science fiction, for example, uh, for an Amazonian uh, hunter-gatherer who has a typical way of thinking, or for people who actually have a special, uh, a spatial, sorry, spatial uh, ways of understanding time, where the, the future is not ahead, or is not, no, maybe the future is to the right, and it has nothing to do with other things because they actually convert sometimes. No, how how can they understand that? I actually realized this also in Ethiopia, talking with uh, with a friend, because they did not un uh, understand the concept of a, of uh, a metaphor. No, so something that for us is so clear as a metaphor, which is used like poetry forever, even in daily life. For someone else, it's not understandable. So we are actually, for example, trying to explain something, and they are not going to get it. And with time, it's the same. No, like uh, we, we are trying to tell someone, even with the space. No, we are trying to tell you know, someone. No, tomorrow will happen, whatever. But tomorrow does not exist for them. <laughs> so how can you actually build, uh, you know, all this science fiction and all that uh, with that? And maybe probably that this was the past. No, like people in the past probably didn't think like us. So how, how can we portray all that uh, into the past? So well, anyway, to close. Do we really think materiality defines the outcomes of society? Now, like what I said before, pan versus play. Now, if the future, uh, like uh, all the great societies, peaceful and advanced, and all these things will dress like with these clothes they usually show us in movies. We're not using that today. No, like if this materiality is actually defining the way we behave as a society, or for example, uh, with urban, why is order better than chaos? No, why do we think that uh, urban order is the outcome of a better society? When, for example, in the past uh, we are finding many cities which are basically chaotic and were the reflection of a society that worked quite well, at least for a time. No? And even what about technology? <laughs> it's better to be connected or disconnected. I don't know if you, if you read this week or last week that China is going to implement one of Black Mirror chapters, <laughs> the one of the likes. No? Uh, so, Chinese people in 50 years will be ranked according to what others like of them and things like this. No? So is actually this dystopian future you know, something that uh, we are aiming for in, in, in some way? So anyway, I think I brought more questions than answers, so even <laughs> ideas. But just think about it, and probably we can have a debate later. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm very easy to reach here.